thinking about um, the testimony that mom gave and the scriptures that she and Sister Dacia brought up, another one came to my mind along those same lines um, that I'd come across a few months back that really blessed me. I, I feel impressed to share that with you. John chapter 9 and verse number 1. To me, these, these first few verses have always been... It gives us... I think when you read certain verses, you get a glimpse into how God thinks. And it, it's just so different than how we think as human beings. Um, but we'll read it and you, you'll see what I mean. And as he passed by Jesus, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? That he would be born blind. Some backstory there. The Jews, many, most Jews had a custom that they believed that when somebody was born in sin or, or bad things happened, it was because uh, somebody sinned, either them or their parents, that sin would, that such a curse would be would come upon them. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered them, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. But it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. I think a lot of times we start thinking, we, we may not have like a doctrine laid out, but we think in these terms a lot of times, and it's very unhealthy thinking, is because things are not like we want them to be, because circumstances arise in our life, we think that, it's because we've sinned. And please don't, I want to be clear. You can sin and bring circumstances on your life. You can make unwise choices and you bring shame and circumstances on yourself and God had nothing to do with it. That's absolutely possible. But what I want to address this morning is sometimes even though you follow after God and you obey God and you're obedient to His Word and you're making wise choices, stuff still happens. Like the situation my mom found herself in, the, the, the road accidents. Um, you know, that happened for a specific purpose. That was done. It was not done because she sinned. I hope y'all won't speed. And I won't even ask that question. <laughs> it was neither that this, this, this man sinned nor his parents, but it was done so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And then using my mom's situation as an example, when she looks back on that situation now, now we know exactly why it happened. But while you're spinning, you, you think, why is this happening? What did I do wrong? Who messed up? But the truth of the matter is it happened that the works of God might be displayed, that God could display His power to her in that specific situation and prove to her that He answers prayers so that even years later, I don't know how many years it's been, but years later she can testify about that and still feel the presence of God as she shares that testimony with someone that was done for a purpose. And I know all of that was like a quick... You know, something like that happens on the road. It, it happens in a matter of seconds. But a lot of situations that we're in right now that are taking months to develop still feels like a tailspin of sorts. But it's the same dynamic. It can be the same. If we've not sinned, if we're not making unwise choices, if we're doing our best to please God, and yet we still find ourselves in circumstances, then why did God allow that to happen? And I think Jesus gives us, the, the, to me, the answer to those types of situations. This, this was done so that the works of God might be displayed in us. And I think the next verse to me is another, a glimpse into a, really a different aspect of God. God's timing. We must work the works of Him, Jesus said. We must work the works of Him who sent me. Jesus saying, I must work the works of God who sent me. As long as it is day, for night is coming when no one can work. So I think the first thing that Jesus teaches us about the mind of God is, not everything that you go through that's bad is because you've done something wrong. Some things are so that it's just not over yet. The story's not over yet. This was done so that the works of God might be displayed in your life. God is going to bring you through. He will bring you through this test. Mm -hmm. 
This is for a purpose. You're suffering for a purpose. I think when we get in a place where we feel like suffering for no reason, that's when depression and discouragement and the enemy really weighs down on our faith and, and drags our faith down. But when we can understand we're suffering for a purpose, that to me, at least for me, that helps me to endure suffering. Endure hardness like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Because I know that there's a, there's a purpose in this. And then secondly, we got to move in God's timing. Yeah. I think God puts us in certain situations in certain, that, that His works can be displayed. Then we get in the situation and instead of keeping faith, in God and staying strong, we get weak in the faith and we miss our window of opportunity for God to deliver us. I can't tell you the number of people that I've seen walk away from God while they were in the midst of a test and a trial. They gave up on God. They missed their window of opportunity. Turn around and left God and never did see their breakthrough. Never did see God deliver them. So we got to understand our season. I guess is one thing that I really want to get apart is get across is We've got to understand our seasons in God. Another aspect of this is God will quickly put you on display. He'll put you in positions like this man was born blind and now all of a sudden all these years later he's lived his life uh, and now all of a sudden he's putting everyone he's the center of attention his issue is the center of attention and God will put you in some uncomfortable places so that his power can be displayed in your life so if you find yourself in an uncomfortable position it's so that the world can look at you. Even other believers, other brothers and sisters in Christ can look at you and see the hand of God move. Like now, mom testified this morning, now we can look at her situation and be reminded of her situation and we can see the power of God displayed in her circumstance, in her trial, in her tribulation. And now I can be encouraged and God's work being displayed in her has an effect on me now. And my faith has increased. So God will put you... I think Job... That's why God did to Job what He did to Job. Mm -hmm. What He allowed Satan to do to Job. Mm -hmm. It's so that He could put Job on display and write a book in the Bible that people can read about thousands of years later to know that God blessed Job double with what He had. So God will put you on display. I'd like to add to Sister uh, uh, Brantley. It says in Psalms 121, starting at verse 5, it says, The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. You will keep your soul. That's what I know. You keep your soul, the keeper. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. The Lord will keep us. He promised that. And if we hold on to Him by faith, the Lord will see us through. Amen. If we faint not. Yeah. Yeah. What that verse is teaching us is that my plans are to get you to pray. Mm. So when you read that, God is ordering our steps so that we will we will seek Him out. We will search Him out. Mm-hmm. If everything is always prosperous and there's no problems, mm-hmm. people don't tend to yeah. they tend to forget God. Right. So God will allow things He'll allow things to come into our lives where the only thing we can do is rely on Him. I think go back to Job. That's all Job could do. He couldn't even trust his wife. His his counselors were terrible. Terrible. Yeah. yeah. Terrible. Curse God and yeah, die. <laughs> What kind of foolishness is that? So the only thing that Job had was 
He turned to God, though He slays me, yet yet will I trust Him. And through all of that, God delivered Job. Going back to Psalms 91, uh, because it's in theme with everything. 91.11, For He shall give His angels charge over thee to keep thee in all of thy ways. They shall bear thee up in thy hands lest I dash thy foot against a stone. I don't know why my, it's set on the King James, but I apologize for that. I just realized that when I was reading it through. But um, this is the same, talking about the protection of God, this is the same exact thing that obviously the enemy quoted when he was tempting Christ. If thou be the Son of God. And he was using the same concept of, you know, if you're actually the Son of God, then all of these things should be applicable to you. Essentially, what the enemy was trying to do was get Christ to deny his own identity in God. He was trying to use Christ's situation to prove to him that he wasn't who he thought he was. He's literally trying to tempt Christ to convince him that he's not the Son of God. That's The whole purpose of what he was doing in that moment was to get him to deny who God said he was, which is ultimately what that he's trying to do to all of us. When we're tempted or we're, we're in situations, he, he's essentially just trying to get us to doubt one, who God said we were and what God said we are or where God's trying to bring us. Whatever God said, he's trying to get us to doubt. It. So God's declaration that, that Christ was his son, I mean, God declared that himself from Amen. the sky. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus was there when he got baptized and he said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. It, I mean, yet, nevertheless, the enemy is trying to convince him, if thou be the Son of God, do this. Or if thou be the Son of God, then surely you, you won't even, you shouldn't even be able to be hurt. And the irony of that is, obviously Christ knowing what he had to do on the cross involved him getting hurt. If you're the Son of God, the angels would prevent you from even dashing your foot against a stone. But yet, you're going to have to endure all of this. So... What's interesting is the enemy is actually using the word, twisting it, and trying to apply it in a way that would actually cause you to doubt what God said. It's crazy how the enemy uses the Bible to do that. Same Lord. The, the yeah. same thing that God's trying to use to, to cause us to build faith and put our faith in, the enemy's trying to take that very same thing, put a spin on it, and apply it in a different light to get us to doubt. The irony of that is remarkable to me. That, that Paul talked about it in Romans 7. We touched on it a little bit last week about how the law being meant for good yet was essentially being used to, to slay him in his flesh and strengthen the sin. That's, it wasn't that the law was unrighteous or God's word is unrighteous. It's that, wow, the enemy is twisting it. And that's what... I'm sorry, my flashlight's on. That's really throwing me off. Mm-hmm. Light of the world. <laughs> That's really been his ploy from the beginning. He dealt with Adam and Eve the same way. Right. Hath God said, always questioning what God has spoke to His people and getting us to question what God has spoken. That's always been his ploy. And even with the, with the blind man, the ploy was, you know, based on what, you know, religious people were saying at the time, or, or because it is, an element of that is true. Like sin most certainly can cause, sure. even, even down to physical ailments. That is true. But in his situation, it wasn't applicable. But I'm pretty sure he, he lived with uh, tremendous burdens or, you know, being beat down from that Something that was true, but for him simply wasn't applicable. So, coming back to Christ, the reality that God will protect his people like he did for Mother Brantley, which, thank you so much for that testimony, Mother Brantley, because something almost identical happened to me. And I've shared it with people, and I feel like, they'd be like, wow, that's, that's cool. But it's, it's one of those things, a lot of times, testimonies that you can't really explain it, but when you explain it, when you live it, it's so much more like, it's almost inexplicable. Right. Like you feel like uh, there's no natural explanation for what just happened. 
something divine most definitely just intervene. And, and I've, I've had a very similar experience. And, um, so I thank you for sharing that testimony, bringing it into my remembrance. But um, the word being twisted, I, I, something that's supposed to be for our faith and for our hope, if we're not careful and we don't, if we're not ignorant to the enemy's devices, he'll twist the word and use it against us. Mm -hmm. And think about how the, the Bible has been used. I mean, so many people wind up falling away from God because of the Bible. They'll go to the Bible and, and, and come across a verse that they can't explain or they feel like they, they don't know the meaning of it. Next thing you know, they're falling away from God because of essentially the enemy. That's what he does. He perverts it and twists it. Don't be ignorant of his devices and how he works. You got to know what he's those he's playing tricks. You got to know what they are. Keep yourself firm in the faith in those times of testing. And I think that's something I think a lot of people overlook is that God is our deliverer. But in order for Him to deliver us, we have to get into something that we need deliverance from. Right. Sure. So like if, if, you don't, if you never get into a, a hardship or a situation where you need a, a Savior, then you never get to experience salvation. Mm -hmm. You never experience deliverance unless you get yourself into a situation you need to be delivered from. You, I mean, all of these things that, that, that God is, He wouldn't even have an opportunity to display who He is except... These opportunities come. It's true. Yeah. These things happen for a purpose. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he said, the, the, the lame man, he said, when Jesus asked him if he would be made whole, in verse 7, he answered him and said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but when the water is troubled, another steps down before me. Like, he was there, and he knew he didn't even have a chance. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't possible under those circumstances that he even be made whole. Talk about a waste of time. Absolutely. Doubt's like a cancer. Whenever you don't root that seed out, it just grows and grows and eats away at your faith over the course of time. Fiery darts, the shield of faith, we've talked about that. As you're talking about here, um, about the Lord God leading us, I was looking at St. John 10 and 27. It said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You see, when the enemy started to speak, well, we ought to know that, not to listen to that. Because we, he says, My sheep know my voice. My sheep hear my voice, and my sheep follow me. So if the enemy, uh, you know, uh, uh, come with me uh, with some twisted, you know, a twisted word, some untruth, I'm not gonna listen to that. As many as, they'll listen to that stuff and run off. They listen to the the what men are saying, the the uh, tradition of men, custom of men, and run with it and think God is speaking. When God is not speaking about those things. He's speaking about His Word, following Christ, as He's saying here. Um, he that uh, desire, you know, to f follow Me, you gotta deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Me. God the Father sent the Son into the world. For us to follow Christ. Because he says, I am the light of the world. And I lead you to the Father. And no man can come to the Father, draw you. And I lead you back to the Father. So it also, uh, Abu, um, be of us to know his voice. Because if we know his voice, the enemy can't lead us astray. It's hard for to lead us astray. If we know his voice, and know his word, keep his word, abide in the word, be faithful to the word. The enemy can't drag us off and, and, and beat us up. Can't drag us off. 
Amen. But God promised to keep us and we keep his word. You're talking about knowing the voice of Christ. If you if you are thinking thoughts of doubt, you know it's not from Christ. That is not the voice of Christ. Christ doesn't speak doubt. That's right. Never has, never will. So if you're thinking thoughts of doubt, you need to realize, recognize this is not the voice of Christ. This is some other voice. The voice of the enemy, the voice of my own doubt, my own flesh rising up. But it is not the voice of Christ. And I need to make sure I get to where I can hear the voice of Christ. Where He speaks faith in my situation. Amen. 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 Um, uh, you see that the Lord says, um, this. it says in the scripture, plainly, the Lord has not, He has not um, given us the spirit of fear. So why are we holding on to fear? He didn't give us that. He gave us power and of love, mm-hmm. of a sound mind. So why are we holding on to doubt and fear and frustration, all these things that he didn't give us, that the enemy. God didn't give us those things. He gave us power to live righteously and live whole, holy. And he even told us that in this life that we live, we're going to trouble, we're going to struggle, we're going to have hardship. We won't be it afflicted. We, we will be uh, discouraged. But he, didn't, did, but he did not give us fear and doubt. Power. Love. Castle of fear. Sound mind to make sound decision. God, what God has given us. So we have got to understand what God has given us and what he has not given us. <laughs>